He was summoned by mistake to become a simple healer, but he's stronger than the legendary heroes. Yusato is an ugly, disgusting, pathetic high schooler with nothing going on in his life. Bad grades, no friends, no girls, just like you. He wishes he was in a fantasy world to cure his boredom of being an ordinary loser. But one day, someone steals his umbrella, and he decides to wait for the rain to pass because princesses cannot get wet. Suddenly, the student council president Suzun arrives and warns him the school is about to close. Yusato takes it as a clue to get his ugly face out of her sight. But Vice President Kazuki appears, the typical perfect dude, and claims that he will let Yuzato have his spare. They ask if he wants to walk home with them, and he cannot believe he gets the chance to walk with the cool kids. As they walk, Yusato tries to give his best shot and asks if they're a couple. The two explain those are just rumors because they spend tons of time together in the student council. Suzum asks if Yusato has some plans for the future. But he plans to stay in his mom's basement. Suzum then reveals that she doesn't have any plans either because she accomplishes all her goals pretty fast. She reveals that for that reason, she feels isolated and doesn't think she belongs to this world. Suddenly, Suzum and Kazuki stop. Yusato is confused and Kazuki asks if he heard the bell, but Yusato doesn't. They hear the bell again, this time even louder. He gets closer when suddenly, a magic circle appears under their feet. Kazuki starts to freak out as Yusato claims they're being summoned to another world. Suzum smiles while asking if he means that they will reach a place full of magic, monsters, and heroes. Seconds later, they open their eyes to find themselves inside a strange room with a guy sitting on a throne. The geezer introduces himself as Lloyd, the King of Linger. The geezer explains they have been summoned as heroes and the usual garbage. There's a demon lord who resurrected and is currently raising its armies. The kingdom has been attacked for the past two years, but they barely survived. Their last hope was to summon heroes from another world to fight against the demon lord. Kazuki asks them to return them to their world, but the king explains that's not possible. Kazuki continues his Karen mode, mentioning they all have families and stuff. But the king kneels in front of Kazuki, promising to find a way to send them home after the job is done. The mage Welsi reveals that the summoning spell seeks people who have the potential to become heroes. In short, everyone with that potential will hear a bell ringing. Suzum and Kazuki understand that condition, but realize that Yusato got here by accident. They then go into Welsi's room to check their magical aptitude. Suzum happily touches a crystal ball and a yellow glow appears. Welsi explains that this means that she can use thunder magic. Kazuki then touches the crystal ball and it turns white. Welsi explains he has a light attribute, which is the strongest attribute because it counters the demon lord. Yusato decides to try it too, but there's a flash of green. Suzum and Kazuki think that's a beautiful and calming color, but Welsi freaks out. She grabs Yusato's hand and runs back into the throne room. There, she tells the king about Kazuki and Suzum's huge potential. But there is a problem, Yuzato. The king laughs but gets shocked when he learns the crystal turned green. The king tells Welsi to shut up, making Yuzato think his attribute is bad. The king starts to plot, mentioning they must take Yuzato as far away from the castle as possible. The king tells his guards to make preparations, and Yuzato asks if he's dangerous and if there is someone else with his attribute. The king freaks out as he replies yes, but that person is bad news. Suddenly, a woman walks into the throne room, scaring everyone. This is the person the king was talking about. She asks the king how the summoning ritual went and if the heroes are already there. The king tries to play it cool, but she notices Yuzato and asks who he is. The king explains he was summoned by mistake along with the heroes. He calls Yuzato an average pleb, but she clearly notices the king is sweating. She asks for his name and introduces herself as Rose, the captain of the rescue team. Welsi intervenes, mentioning the heroes are waiting by the crystal ball, and tells her she will take Rose there. Rose accepts that and prepares to leave. The king feels relieved everything went well, but Yusato wants to know what his magic attribute means. He stupidly asks what a green light means. Upon hearing those words, Rose stops. Everyone inside the room starts to freak out. Rose turns back and asks if he just said green. Yusato confirms, and she tells the king that she will be taking Yusato with her. The king freaks out and Welsi casts a spell, creating a bubble around Yusato and forcing him out of the castle. Yet, Rose dashes outside with her insane speed. Welsi's bubble gets out of the window and tries to take him as far as possible outside the kingdom. However, Rose's speed and power enable her to catch up with him. She then punches the bubble, breaking it. 
Yusato thinks he's done for, yet, Rose manages to reach and catch him. She tells the king that she will turn Yuzato into a proper healer and walks away. Minutes later, Welsi explains to Suzium and Kazuki that Yusato was taken. They're worried he might be in danger, but Welsi explains that's not the case because he was taken to the rescue squad. She reveals that Yusato's attribute is healing magic. Healers are rare in this world and Rose is one of them. Welsi continues to explain that Rose will teach Yusato everything she knows, but her training methods are unorthodox. After reaching the base, Rose explains Yuzato has the potential to become a healer. He's pretty confused, and she reveals he will be living here from now on. She then calls the rest of the members, but when Yuzato looks at them, he realizes they're literally a band of bandits. Rose tells them to take care of Yuzato, but they all look at him like serial killers. He tries to back away while scared in fear, but the guys introduce themselves, which looks more like a robbery. Rose then explains they all belong to the squad, but are not healers. In fact, her rescue squad has only two more healers, but they're stationed somewhere else. Which is why she will personally teach him about healing magic. Yusato freaks out, his instincts are telling him to scream and run, but he can't move. He tries to ask for another instructor, but she ignores him while saying that training starts tomorrow. The bandit gang smiles at him and tells him how miserable his life will become because Rose will be teaching him. In short, he will be living in hell. The next day, Yusato meets Kazuki and Suzum, who are relieved that he's alright. He apologizes for worrying them, but remembers that Rose exists and that she will train him starting today. The two are surprised about this supposed hellish training and ask if he's prepared. Yusato confirms, mentioning he has nothing else to do because he wants to be able to help them someday. Rose suddenly steps outside and asks if the heroes are gone. Yusato gets scared to return to reality and doesn't reply. Rose then explains he's not in prison and that he can meet his friends when he wants, as long as he isn't training. Yusato thanks her, and she gives him a diary to write down his training program, experiences, or whatever he wants. His first day of training was the opposite of hell in short, his first task was to concentrate and relax. He feels something on his chest and Rose explains that's magic, and she will teach him how to project it out of his body. After finishing that training, Rose orders him to read a book. Using the images, Rose explains their current location and where the demons live. Since they're close to each other, Linger is the demon's first target. She tells him to read the book as he will learn about the world nations, races, and demons. Yusato starts reading it, thinking this training is easy. However, the next couple of days were different as Rose forced him to run until his body couldn't do it anymore. Yet, every time his legs gave up, Rose slapped him with healing magic and ordered him to run again. Yusato gets up and runs for his life, but she tells him that even if he dies, she will heal him back to life just to make him run. Yusato thinks she's out of her mind, but he decides to vent about it in his diary. On the sixth day, Rose thought he was slow and insulted him. He ends up hugging the floor and again decides to vent on his diary. However, while trying to get up, he notices that his hand is glowing. He's confused that it looks like healing magic, but doesn't understand why it's activating. Days 8 and 9 were pretty much the same, run into exhaustion, get slapped or kicked, and repeat it for the whole day. However, without noticing, Yusato was healing himself every time he got injured. He later realizes that he's using healing magic as second nature, and starts running again without being ordered to. Yet, things changed on the 10th day, since he now knows how to use magic, he can now run without getting tired. However, he still had doubts if he could help Kazuki or Suzum, as he could only run but Rose added 1,000 push-ups to his training program. Yusato knows he cannot do it by himself, that's why he continues to use healing magic to make sure his body can handle it. Rose then reveals she's forcing him to train his body because he needs to run from the enemy on the battlefield and save his fallen comrades. Therefore, the faster he runs, the faster he will be able to save them. Yusato is surprised by those words, but she orders him to continue doing push-ups. He continues the training, but is surprised that Rose didn't yell at him. He thinks he should be happy about it, but in reality, he's scared. He quickly got used to this training, and Rose started to add some weights while he ran. On the 21st day, Kazuki and Suzum visit him alongside the princess and a knight. Upon arriving there, they are shocked to see Yusato doing push-ups with Rose sitting on a huge rock on top of him. She complains that he's too slow and motivates him to not quit but our boy grows a pair and says that this is too easy because she's light. Rose then places another rock on top of the other. 
Despite the initial regret, Yusato continues, using his magic to heal himself. Rose even admires his determination, saying that he's becoming her type of guy. The other two cannot believe Yusato is going through this, but Suzume quickly starts drooling after checking his muscles. However, the knight gets angry and grabs Rose's collar, asking why she is trying to destroy Yusato. Rose grabs his hand as she tells him that she will use her methods to make Yusato become her right-hand man. She claims that Yusato is a catch because he hates losing, but what she loves the most is that he doesn't give up. Rose then orders him to take a break and have lunch. While resting under a tree, Yusato finds out that the guy is the kingdom's strongest knight, Sigles. He is the one who's teaching Kazuki and Suzume how to use the sword. Yusato finds it impressive. Kazuki then asks if Yusato's training has always been as bad as just now. Yusato simply replies that today was pretty easy. Suzume decides to check out our boy's muscles despite him being shy about it. She's all into his huge abs, even the princess cannot contain her curiosity. Kazuki then continues, explaining that he felt like Yusato was having a hard time. Yusato confirms that he wanted to run in the beginning, but he's fine now because he enjoys training and life here. Suzume is impressed that he already found a place to belong. He shows his healing magic and explains he also wants to help them. Suzume uses this chance to flirt, telling him to save her when she needs it. Yet, Yusato simply tells her it's too late to act like a normal girl. She gets mad, but even the princess agrees with him. Yet, the next day, Rose gives him a bag and tells him they will head outside. The bandit-looking guys get worried as they realize it's finally time. Yusato gets confused, but after some hours, they reach a cliff. Rose reveals that ahead of him, there's a forest called the Darkness of Linger. She then gives him his orders, he can only come home after killing a grand grizzly. Yusato tries to refuse it because that's one of the strongest monsters. Plus, he doesn't know how to fight because she only taught him how to run. Yet, Rose gets annoyed and throws him into the forest. While in mid-air, Yusato starts to freak because he's on a free fall to death. He then turns around and casts healing magic to survive the impact. Yet, he refuses to die and turns around again, using his healing magic to land safely. He's relieved that he managed to survive and uses his healing magic again to recover from minor injuries. However, he knows that since he's now inside the forest, he must follow Rose's instructions if he wants to go back home. Therefore, he makes his decision to kill a grand grizzly. He claims that's just a seven-foot-tall monster, which is nothing to someone who survived hell. Suddenly, that same bear appears behind him. He starts running away from this chasing bear, who's a lot bigger than he thought. But since his training was basically just running, he knows he can outrun it. He thinks there's no way a bear can catch up with him, but the bear is just behind. He remembers all his training and how he endured that suffering. He thinks the bear is nowhere as scary as Rose and decides to fight it. However, two more bear clubs appear behind the big one. Time to hit the hells and outrun all those bears while complaining. He suddenly hears a waterfall nearby and decides to jump inside it. Luckily, he manages to escape those bears and survives. He swims to shore and dries up his clothes. He checks his backpack and sees he only has some rations, a canteen and a knife. He complains about not having anything to start a fire and calls her a demon. He bites the harder than a brick bread and thinks his mission is impossible. But his situation becomes worse when he hears some wolves. He decides to figure out what he will be doing the next day. He marks day on a tree and falls asleep. He's now prepared for the mission and decides to explore the forest. He keeps marking trees to avoid getting lost and thinks that he should know his enemy first. He's trying to find the Grand Grizzly's den and walks through the whole forest. He finally gets some clues when he sees some claw marks on a tree. He thinks that's the Grand Grizzly's claws and it could be nearby. He then suddenly hears some noise from the bushes and pulls out his knife. Turns out it's just a rabbit. He gets confused, thinking it could be a monster, but the rabbit moves forward and collapses. He notices an injury and asks if the rabbit is injured. Yusato is surprised because the rabbit shakes his head up and down as if he understood him. He then decides to use his healing magic to cure the rabbit and pats him. He hides behind a tree after telling the rabbit to be careful. However, it seems like the rabbit is following him. He tells the rabbit to go away because it will be dangerous. But the rabbit refuses to. Yuzato keeps walking away, but the rabbit keeps chasing him. Since the rabbit refuses to stop, Yusato asks if he knows where the Grand Grizzly is. The rabbit starts walking to the side and looks back at him. Yusato understands this must mean to follow the rabbit. 
The rabbit then leads him through the forest, taking Yuzato to the Grand Grizzly's den. Yuzato decides to observe the bear's behavior without being spotted. According to the book he read, Grand Grizzlies live in groups, which seems to be the case. The rabbit then acts all cute, asking for a pat. Another day has passed, and Yusato is unsure if he should fill his canteen with untreated water. However, he doesn't have time to think about it. Suddenly, the rabbit appears and jumps onto his shoulder, surprising Yusato. He thought the rabbit went away, but he returned. He thinks this is a strange rabbit and tells him they will observe the bears again. There's no change in behavior, the big one is sleeping again, but the blue ones are starting to look cute. Yuzato also thinks the rabbit is cute, and this mission somehow is letting him have some fun. However, on the fourth day, Yusato feels some stomach aches. He regrets drinking the river water, especially because healing magic doesn't make it better. He compares it to being poisoned and thinks there must be a way to cure it. The rabbit appears once again asking for some pats, and Yusato forgets for a moment about his pain. He only recovers on the fifth day, and the rabbit takes him to a small pond. Yuzato understands this water is safer to drink and notices how it looks cleaner than the river. He gives it a try and says that it even tastes better. The rabbit, however, seems to be scared. Yuzato wants to know what's wrong, but the rabbit simply starts climbing a tree. Yuzato is confused and also climbs the tree. He notices the rabbit looking at an empty place. He thinks the rabbit senses a monster approaching, but that's strange because the rabbit wasn't afraid when he saw the grand grizzly. He notices the rabbit shaking in fear but he then hears some noise. He looks carefully and sees a huge white snake. The rabbit starts to shiver, and Yuzato wonders what kind of monster that snake is. He never saw that monster in his book. The snake is slithering away, and Yuzato can feel that this is a monster way stronger than a grand grizzly. He feels an intense bloodlust coming from it and promises to never get near it. For the next few days, Yuzato was still feeling uneasy, but he kept watching the bears. He thinks their behavior has never changed, and for some reason, he feels calm when looking at them. However, he knows that if he doesn't kill the Grand Grizzly he cannot go home. And with that thought, he decides that tomorrow is the day he must do it. Yet, the next day is filled with rain, and the rabbit trying to convince Yusato to not go. Yusato says that he must do it, but the rabbit keeps trying to pull his leg. Since the weather is an average day in England, he decides to wait until the rain stops. After some hours, the rain finally stops, and Yuzato grows a pear, promising to make minced meat out of the Grand Grizzly. The rabbit jumps onto his shoulder, but there's no way Yuzato will be stopped from heading back home. The rabbit feels sad, but still lets him go. After reaching the bear den, Yuzato prepares his knife while the rabbit jumps out of his shoulder. Yuzato then walks into the nest, but he strangely sees two of the three bears are dead. He wonders what happened and thinks that Rose will kill him because something killed the Grand Grizzly before him. He looks closely and notices some bite marks. He realizes the one who did it was that huge snake. However, the snake didn't eat them, which means she did it for fun. Yusato then hears some noise coming from some rocks and gets startled. Upon looking closely, he sees the small bear coming out. The little bear tries to wake up its mother, to no avail. Upon seeing that, Yusato thinks about how he hates about losing. He never wanted to admit defeat to Rose, but his prey was now gone, and his resolve resulted in nothing. The little bear starts crying after realizing he won't play with his mother again, and Yuzato thinks that he hates to see this stuff the most. He makes up his mind and walks away while promising the small bear that he will take revenge for him. The small bear watches him go, sniffs the floor, and goes in another direction. Meanwhile, Kazuki and Suzum come to visit Yusato, when they're told that he's been training in the forest for the past 10 days. Kazuki thinks that's a bit too long, Watch this but the next big video. guy reveals they the cannot go one. against her orders. While walking away, Suzum tells Kazuki that he seems fired up when it comes to Yusato. He asks if she isn't worried, but she replies that despite her worries, they should trust Yusato and Rose. Back in the forest, Yusato is making a spear out of a stick and gets his needed calories. After some stretches, he makes up his mind and asks the rabbit to take him to the snake. The rabbit is worried, but he tells it to just take him to the snake and leave. The rabbit starts walking and Yuzato follows. After a long walk, they manage to find the snake, but Yuzato sees the little bear trying to fight the snake. Upon looking the snake in the eyes, Yuzato thinks he's scared, but not as scary as Rose. He charges forward, surprising the little bear. He tries to throw his level 30 spear, but the snake tries to eat his head. He manages to avoid it and stabs its eye. 
The snake uses its tail to push him against a tree, but he uses his heel to recover and get up. He then pulls out his knife and the snake attacks him. Yusato knows he must use the blind spot, which is the right eye, to attack the snake. He dodges the attack and uses his speed to run toward the snake while it recovers. However, the snake uses its tail to attack him. He dodges it, but the smoke cloud allows the snake to bite his arm. He shouts in pain, realizing the snake was biting him. He uses his heel to recover from the pain and uses the bitten arm to stab the knife from inside its mouth. The snake gives up and sets him free. However, Yusato starts to feel its poison. He thinks it's not fair, but he knows a way to heal himself from his experience with the river water. If his injury is internal, he must use his heel to recover internally. With that, he recovers and charges again. The snake uses the tail to attack him, but the small bear decides to help and manages to block it. Yusato then jumps over the bear and lands on top of the snake's head. He then punches the snake with his healing magic to knock it down and follows up by stabbing its eye again with the spear. The snake tries to resist, but in the end, it gives up and stops moving. Yuzato lays on the ground and takes some deep breaths, happy that he managed to do it. However, the little bear is staring at him closely. Yuzato realizes that he will now become the little one's lunch. However, the bear treats him gently and Yuzato pats it, mentioning that he managed to get revenge for him. He tells the little one that he cannot heal him right now because he uses most of his magic to cure the poison. Yet suddenly the snake raises again and looks at them. Yuzato cannot move, and the little one tries to carry him away. However, our boy is heavy. He orders the bear to run away, but the snake lunges to attack them. Yuzato realizes this is the end and starts cursing Rose. He blames everything on her and calls her an ogre. Suddenly, Rose appears from the air and kicks the snake down. She starts cursing the snake, saying that it should have died when Yusato was fighting. Both Yusato and the little one are shocked. Yusato asks what she is doing here, and she reveals the rabbit called her. Yusato is confused, but she explains that the rabbit is her pet Kukuru, who she told to watch over Yusato. Yusato doesn't believe it because the rabbit was injured when they met each other. Rose then reveals it was all a scam to gain his trust. Rose then explains she was always nearby just in case, but she didn't expect this snake to appear in the forest. Yusato asks what this is, and she explains it's a monster modified by the Demon Lord's army. In fact, Sigles wasn't able to defeat the snake in the last Demon Lord's invasion. She doesn't know how the snake managed to beat the Grand Grizzly, especially because the kingdom's elite force can't do it. Yusato thinks she's a monster because she told him to do that. Rose reveals she never expected him to win that fight. She just wanted him to get experience however, things got interesting, and she wanted to see what he would do. He complains that he almost died, and the little bear also comes to defend Yusato. Rose notices the little one likes Yusato, making him think that the bear lost his parents and is lonely. He pats the bear, and the two act friendly. Rose compliments Yusato and tells the bear he will be coming with them, but he has to carry Yusato. The bear takes Yusato on his back, and Rose grabs the two with one hand and carries them back. She tells Yuzato that he passed this exam, and now he has the right. He gets confused, but she reveals that despite lacking training, he has the right to stand next to her on the battlefield. She says that he has everything, a body that can withstand pain, physical prowess, and more importantly, an indomitable spirit. That's something that the other healers in her squad lack. She tells him to be proud, and they might still make it back in time. Yusato is confused, but she reveals the Demon Lord's army is preparing to attack. Yusato is shocked to hear that because another war will break out. Rose confirms and tells him that he will heal the injured on the front lines along her side. This means he will now belong to the advance guard. Yusato is shocked and asks what about the rest of their members. Rose explains they only have two more healers, but they have different roles. Yusato is unsure if he can do the same as Rose, but she replies that they still have some time to make him stronger. Meanwhile, the Demon Lord asks a subordinate Amila about their plan to invade the Linger Kingdom. She confirms that everything is on track, and they're all prepared to advance soon. The Demon Lord is relieved and states that she will be the one commanding their army. He mentions they failed their last invasion, and warns her that she should give her all while also avoiding death. She gives him some hope, and he dismisses her. While walking back, another guy noticed Amila was nervous while having the audience with the Demon Lord. 
She tells him to do his job instead of teasing her and calls him Monster Dr. Kenobi. The guy claims his name is already cute and replies that his job is going pretty great after all, he managed to complete a new demon modified monster prototype. He asks if she wants to see it and she follows him. She then sees a huge snake similar to the one Yuzato fought before. The demon is hyped out about this monster and reveals its name. Amila, however, mentions that's the same name he used on his last prototype that went missing during their attempt to invade Linger. The guy complains his snake was beaten up by Sigley's and it ran away however, this new monster is way stronger. Still, Amila couldn't care less because she knows there's someone in Linger who's stronger than Sigley's. The guy gets curious and asks if she's talking about the kidnappers. She confirms, mentioning they never fight, but they're still on the battlefield carrying the wounded back to the rear at some insane speed. The guy thinks they minimize casualties, but Amilla explains the kidnapper's boss is a healer, who not only has insane healing skills, but is also an excellent fighter. That person is Rose, the strongest person in Linger. Amilla deeply hates Rose because Rose fought her master, yet, the guy didn't stay alive to tell what happened. This monster tells her to calm down because she cannot fight during their invasion because she must command the army. Yet, Amilla walks away, mentioning she will leave the fight to their immortal dark magic user. Back to Yusato, he's happy because he missed his bed, to the point where he also enjoys Tong's snores. Yet, he must wake up and do his stuff. He gives some fruits to the little bear for breakfast and notices Rose's rabbit nearby. However, Yusato tells him that he cannot forgive him for taking advantage of his innocence. The rabbit acts cute and Yuzato almost falls for it. Yet, he tries to refuse to be nice to the rabbit, but he cannot resist it. He keeps giving the bear more fruits and calls it Blurin. Rose arrives repeating the same name and she asks if that's its name. Yusato confirms it, mentioning he combined the words Blue Grizzly. Rose is shocked to hear that but focuses on saying that she told the king about the bear and it will now be the property of the rescue squad. Yuzato is confused about that, and she reveals that the bear must also do his duty if he wants to stay here. The little one is scared with her smile and hides. Turns out that from now on, Yusato must not only run with weights, but also carry the bear. Rose explains, this will be a regime close to what will happen on the battlefield. She tells him to think of the bear as someone who needs rescue. She orders him to start running, and he follows her orders. In fact, Yusato only considers this as a training with more weight than usual. He thinks that all he needs to do is to control his healing magic properly. Yet, Rose shouts that he's too slow and the wounded will die. Yusato complains but picks up the pace. Suddenly, Tong comes out of a bush and tries to punch him, but Yusato avoids it. Another guy comes running into him, but he also dodges. He thinks they're crazy and asks what they are doing. The thugs chase him and explain, this is a simulation of what will happen on the battlefield. Yusato tries to run faster, but the thugs yell others are hiding too. Yet Yusato speeds up and keeps running for the next hour. The others throw some sticky water balloons from trees, forcing Yusato to run while holding his breath. Some appear from the ground with wooden swords and try to hit him, but he dodges. After three hours of running, another guy cuts a rope to make Yusato play Donkey Kong. But in the fourth hour, Yusato finally uses his magic but feels strange. The rabbit comes out from a bush and smiles. Yet, Yusato panics and jumps over him thinking the rabbit is doing it again. With time, Yusato feels even stranger and finally collapses without knowing why. Yusato is confused because he should at least be able to last for half a day. Rose appears, explaining that will be his stamina on the battlefield. Yusato is confused, but she explains the human body also gets fatigued from feelings like anxiety, fear, and frustration. That's the reason why he ran out of energy faster than normal. Yusato asks what he can do, but she heals him up and tells him to get used to those emotions. She says he must build up his mental fortitude and situational awareness. She then walks away and orders him to run through the town and around the castle during the afternoon. Yusato is confused but follows those orders. Yet, every citizen is shocked to see a guy running in the streets with a blue grizzly on his back. Yuzato already knew this would happen despite Blurin being a well-behaved monster. Suddenly, the people start smiling as they realize that Yuzato is also part of the rescue squad. Suddenly, Blurin smells something and wakes up. The bear points forward and Yuzato stops the buy fruit stall. He doesn't have any money but asks the name of those fruits, the old lady calls it pearls. Yusato then asks her why the people aren't freaking out while he carries a monster on his back. The lady replies it's because he's part of the rescue squad. 
she talks about his uniform and reveals the gang also runs through the city all the time. Yusato thinks about it and confirms someone would get used to it after seeing those scary bandits running around. Before he leaves, the lady gives him a pearl, and Blurin eats it. As Yuzato runs away, a little girl asks the old lady if he belongs to the rescue squad. The lady confirms and asks why she wants to know. The girl simply dismisses it and looks at him. Yusato then plans to make a quick stop by the castle to visit Suzum and Kazuki. However, a guy notices him pass by and starts running after him. The guy chases him while asking Yusato to stop, but he keeps getting behind. Yusato only notices when the guy collapses on the floor and asks if he's okay. Yuzato heals the guy and asks what he wants. The guy reveals he wanted to say hi because he also is part of the rescue squad. Yusato is confused but the guy introduces himself as Fleur, one of the other two healers. After hearing the whole story, Fleur is impressed to know that Yusato was summoned by mistake along with the heroes. Yusato claims he almost forgot about it because he's been training hard every day. Fleur thinks Yusato is amazing for being able to keep up with Rose's training because he and his sister couldn't. Yusato asks if she's the other healer. Fleur confirms, mentioning she's five years younger and they run a clinic in the castle town to heal people with magic. Yet Yusato is confused about why Fleur collapsed just now. Fleur explains he's not good at using healing magic on himself, he can only do it to heal others. Yusato is surprised there are other types of healers and Fleur confirms, mentioning they're all part of the rescue squad. Therefore, when it's needed, they help their captain and heal everyone. Upon hearing those words, Yusato remembers when Rose told him that he would go to the front lines and heal the injured by her side. He gets worried and asks Fleur what their roles on the battlefield are. Fleur replies the bandits retrieve the injured from the front lines while he and his sister heal them. In short, they're the rear support. Yet, Yusato reveals that he will be going to the front lines with Rose. Fleur is shocked and Yusato questions if someone like him can do it. Fleur replies the ones in most danger are the heroes and the knights, and if they get injured, they will most likely die. But if they have healers on the front lines, it means those people can be saved. He reveals that's a tough and dangerous job however, he knows Rose would never bring someone who she didn't completely trust. Yusato thinks about his friends and gets worried. Fleur then gets up to return to the clinic and Yusato decides to continue his training. Before departing, Flora asks Yuzato to not hate Rose because she doesn't know how to measure her words. Yet, Yuzato tells Flora to not worry because he never hated her in fact, he also has some words to tell her. Yuzato then starts running and Flora feels relieved that Rose finally met the person she was looking for. Suddenly, Flora's sister comes to complain, asking if he has a death wish for wandering around. He tells her that he's not that frail, but her look tells us otherwise. He then tells her that he just met someone interesting, and she gets curious about that person. Yet, Fleur replies she will eventually meet and like him. Meanwhile, Yusato reaches the castle and asks for permission to enter with the bear. The guard allows him, confusing Yusato who asks how he can bring a monster to the castle. The guy replies that Rose has signed it off, so he should go ahead. Upon reaching the training grounds, Yusato watches Suzium practicing against three soldiers. She gets distracted when she sees it and asks about the bear. They take a break, and Yusato tells her everything about surviving in the forest filled with monsters. Yet, she's way more excited to pet Blurin. Yusato tells her to go ahead, but Blurin slaps her hand away, refusing her pat. Yusato apologizes, saying Blurin is shy, but she is even more excited. She asks Blurin to become her friend, but he bites her hand when she tries to pat him. Yusato says this could mean Blurin thinks she's a bad person, but he then bites his hand too. She teases him, but they eventually let it go. Yusato then notices the injuries on her hand, and she claims it's because she's training seriously. He then holds her hand and heals it, surprising her with his amazing skill. The girl thinks he came all the way here to visit her and blushes. But Yusato confirms he came here to visit her and Kazuki. She feels rejected and reveals Kazuki left the kingdom with Sigli's to get some combat experience against monsters. While walking, Kazuki asks Sigli's if it's true that the Demon Lord's army will start invading soon. Sigli's confirms it, mentioning it will probably have a much stronger army than last time. And that's why they summon Suzum and Kazuki, heroes who can boost their soldiers' morale. Yet, Kazuki is still unsure and hesitates. Still, he promises to give his all, but they all stop because there's a pack of hung wolves in front of them. They prepare to battle, and Kazuki makes his resolve. 
Yuzato is impressed, but wonders if Kazuki will be okay. Suzum replies it will only last some days, but once he returns, she will be the one performing that training. Yuzato teases her, mentioning she will probably enjoy every moment of becoming OP in another world. Yet, she complains because he's not worried about her at all. After the conversation, Yusato decides to continue his training. He thinks about the other two doing their best for the incoming battle and that they're going to fight. And if they do it, he also wants to somehow help and not be the one staying behind to be protected. He thinks that in his previous world, he only wished to do the things he couldn't. However, this is not who he is anymore. After returning home and putting Blur in to sleep, Yusato meets Rose. She asks if his body has already gotten used to the training, and he answers he got a bit used to it. Yet, he wants to train more. Upon hearing those words, Rose tells him to continue and walks away. Yusato stops her to ask about her words to steal himself. He explains that he freaked up after almost dying to the snake and then heard about the incoming invasion. He initially thought he didn't want to be a part of this, yet today he changed his mind. He won't fight or kill enemies, however, he will do anything to save everyone because he's a member of the rescue squad. Rose smiles for the first time and bumps her fist into his chest, telling him to have pride in saving people and the values of their squad. Upon hearing those words, Yusato smiles and calls her captain. However, the next day, Rose wakes up by putting a heavy back on top of him and tells him the king ordered him to join Suzume's training. On the way, Yusato asks Rose why he must join Suzume's training because Kazuki went with Sigley's. Rose explains he was supposed to join Kazuki's training as well. However, she refused because he had just returned from the forest. The king later sent another request, to which she couldn't refuse again. She tries to calm him down by mentioning he's only going to act as a healer if needed. She advises him to simply play his part for the next three days and return home. They finally arrive at the meeting point and Suzume is happy that Yusato will be joining her. She thinks he only brought Blurin with him to help them bond with each other, yet Yusato explains he only brought Blurin because he hates everyone else. She starts complaining about his lack of empathy and never playing along with her random BS. She then introduces the rest of her group, Aruku the Knight and Korin the Mage. Before leaving, Rose tells Suzume to not be reckless because Yusato can only heal wounds and cure poison. If someone dies, they will stay dead. Suzume takes the advice to heart, and Rose thinks she will be fine since she was trained by Sigley's. She then turns to Yusato and reveals she has no advice for him. He's confused and she approaches him, asking if he has a problem with it. Yusato replies he's good and she gets going. Yet, he's suddenly surprised when Suzume talks about how strong Rose is. Yet, she refuses to explain it when asked about it and starts moving. Meanwhile, at the castle, the princess gets worried about Kazuki and asks what he's doing. He explains that he's training his sword skills, but she mentions that he just arrived the day before and was supposed to rest. He dismisses it, explaining he had a great night of sleep and can handle training again. She thinks he's pushing himself too much, but he flexes his muscles to show off he's fine. The princess realizes she's holding his arm and gets shy before walking away. Back at Yusato's group, Suzume recounts Kazuki's experience while training. Yusato didn't expect Kazuki to be so worn out, but he had told Suzume the experience was worth it. He battled tons of monsters inside the darkness of Linger and Suzume reveals that's where they're heading to right now. Upon hearing that name, Yusato reminds the time he was observing Blurin and his family. He wonders if Blurin misses his home, but that moment is interrupted by Suzume, asking if the little bear will wake up soon. She thinks this is the perfect chance to pet the bear since he won't bite her. She tries to do it, but Yusato slaps her hand. She initially gets confused but tries to pet the bear several other times, all denied by Yusato's slaps. She finally asks what is he doing that, but he replies with the same question. She uses this chance to flirt with him, mentioning he's smacking her hand and talking her down. She thinks he became a sadist, but he has no idea of what she's saying. Blurin then wakes up, and Yuzato tells him to walk by himself. But the bear can barely walk straight because he's sleepy. Suzume thinks this is her chance. She tells Blurin to hop on her back, and she will carry him. Yuzato tries to stop her from doing it, but Blurin lies on her back. Suzume is happy that she finally touched Blurin's fluffy fur and tries to get up. However, she falls flat on her face because the bear is too heavy. Yusato helps her out, and they continue walking as he tells her to not get hurt outside of battle. She thanks him for healing her, but they're forced to stop because the mage senses multiple presences ahead of them. 
The knight warns them to be prepared to fight monsters, however the mage notices he's wrong. Some bandits appear from the bushes as they cannot ambush anyone who already knows about their presence. The bandits do their usual stuff, threatening them to hand over their goods or else. The knight refuses to, making the bandits mention how big their group is. Yuzato is confused about what the plot is going on because these guys aren't intimidating at all. He notices Suzium pulling his shirt and he tries to be a chad and reassure her that everything is fine. Still, this crazy girl is excited to see real bandits, mentioning that she has never seen one before. Yusato thinks this girl is clearly out of her mind, but Blurin who was at the back appears by Yusato's side. The bandits start to panic because they never expected someone to tame a blue grizzly. However, one of them tells the others to take a better look because that's just a cub. The rest of the bandits think this is their chance to get a bear and skin it. Yuzato gets mad at those words, but Suzium attacks the bandits before he can do anything else. Yuzato is impressed that she managed to control her power to simply knock the bandit out with lightning. She explains she practiced a lot to make it perfect, and Yuzato incentivizes her to go wild. The bandits decide to charge forward, thinking that Suzium cannot use her magic if they get close. Yet, Suzium electrocutes them while they run. Yusato is acting like a cheerleader while also calling Suzium a human stun gun and a human electric eel. Yet suddenly, the mage senses something new. Seconds later, a horde of fall boars pass by them. The knight is confused because these monsters should live deep in the forest. The boards almost hit Yusato from the back, but Blurin headbutts them. Suzum tries to electrocute the rest, but another boar dashes toward her. Yusato tries to protect her, but they get hit and are both projected into the air. They start falling deep into the forest, but Yusato uses his body to protect her from the fall. He casts healing magic while taking the heavy hits from the tree branches, but they still end up falling into the nearby river. After returning to the water's surface, Yusato realizes that's the same river he fell when he came to the forest. He knows there's a waterfall ahead and tells Suzum to take a deep breath. After falling, Suzum tries to wake him up and carries him to the shore while mentioning that she will pay this debt. Yuzato then wakes up, mentioning he's fine and that this is quite embarrassing. She gets all shy and pushes him away after realizing that he woke up. Yuzato then uses his magic to heal her wound, but Suzum apologizes for putting him in this situation. He dismisses it, mentioning that he's glad that they at least got into this together. He looks around saying he never expected to return so soon. He then explains that Rose dumped him here to train before, and that this forest is filled with monsters far stronger than those boars. Yusato then sits down to check their gear and decide how to move from now on. Suzum asks if it's not better to escape the forest because of the monsters. Yusato reveals it's about to get dark and it might rain, therefore it's better to find a spot to camp and move tomorrow. She asks if he knows about any safe spot. He replies that he slept on a tree branch and asks if she's fine with it. Suzu mentions she never climbed a tree because she was never allowed to despite wanting it. Yuzato thinks she came from a wealthy family who sheltered her entire life. Yuzato then finds a cave and decides to camp there, mentioning that not only it will cover them from rain, but it's also better than going deeper into the forest. He then advises her to get out of her wet clothes and she shyly tells him to not peek. Yet, after noticing Yuzato's stupid face, she realizes that he never thought about it. Yuzato then decides to use Suzum's lighting abilities to fish and start a fire. He's quite happy about all of this because he didn't have a fire the last time. However, he notices Suzum on the corner. He apologizes for this awkward situation, but she's more into checking all his muscles from afar. She suddenly looks up and sees some monsters. She gets excited and Yuzato calls them venom monkeys, explaining that he read about them. The monkeys get down and he tells her the monkeys are friendly, but she can get poisoned if she touches them. Yet, Suzum is already touching one. Yusato asks what the plot is she doing, but she replies that she has already been poisoned by the monkey's cuteness. She tells him there's nothing to fear, but the small monkey bites her finger. She collapses, forcing Yusato to cure her. Meanwhile at the palace, the king gets informed by the mage's familiar that Yusato and Suzum are missing. Kazuki wants to know more about it, and the king explains all the information he currently has. The king reveals he didn't want to reveal this to Kazuki, but the princess forced him to do. Kazuki asks if they already sent a research party, but the king reveals they will depart tomorrow. Kazuki thinks that's too late and decides to head out by himself right now. However, big gorilla mommy Rose appears and tells him to stop. She tells him to not worry because Yuzato is with Suzium. 
she bluntly explains that Yusato won't die so easily, so if Yusato is fine, Suzyung should be safe. Kazuki is shocked to hear that, after all, Yusato is a random dude who came here by mistake and got healing magic. Talking about the devil, Yusato is having an amazing time, thinking it's way easier to survive in the forest with Suzyun by his side. She gets annoyed because he's literally calling her camping equipment, but he dismisses it. She lets it pass, and since he notices that she's tired, he decides they should sleep in turns, starting by her. She rejects it, mentioning that he should sleep first because he used his healing magic on her. He accepts the deal and lies down. While awake, Suzyum looks at Yusato and asks if he's asleep. He reveals he's still awake, and she asks how he feels about being summoned to this world. She asks if he thinks about ever returning home. Yusato explains that's a tough question because he does want to go home. Yet, he also has a reason to stay in this world. Suzum then reveals she doesn't want to go back, but is surprised that he didn't ask why. He asks her if he should do it, and she confirms. He reveals that he knows why she doesn't want to go back. It's because she likes this world more than theirs. Suzum confirms, explaining there's nothing left for her in their world. She's willing to throw away her family, friends, or who she was before, just to stay here. She reveals that she was waiting her entire life for this moment, she calls it a chance to free herself. She feels she's finally free because she has nothing to tie her down in this world. I guess she forgot she's one of the heroes. Yet, she's surprised to hear Yusato say that sounds good to him. He doesn't understand her expression, and she asks if he's not disappointed by who she really is. Yusato explains he always wanted to change and stop being an ordinary guy who is passive. Therefore, he doesn't think they're different from each other. Suzum is impressed, but Yusato continues. When they arrived, he didn't want to hold them back, and that's why he always accepted Rose's training. But now, he's determined to protect her, Kazuki, and everyone else in this kingdom as a member of the rescue squad. When asked about it, Suzum replies she also wants to protect this place as a hero. Upon confirming their resolve, Yusato says they will save the kingdom together and forget their old world. Suzum smiles, mentioning that Yusato has grown a lot since coming here. Yusato also reveals that he feels closer to her. In their world, he always thought about her as a flawless perfect girl. Yet, Suzum is shocked because he never treated her as if she was a perfect girl. But she reveals that she doesn't mind it because she'd rather be close to him than be admired from afar. After blushing, Yusato decides to hide his face by going to sleep. The next day, they walk through the forest, and Yusato tells her to be careful. They hear some noise and prepare for a fight, but turns out to be Blurin, who quickly jumps on top of Yuzato. The night dude appears, out of breath and collapses. After recovering, he explains they've been searching for them, but Blurin suddenly started to run away. They followed him, thinking the bear would lead to them, and here they are. Suzum tells Blurin he did a good job, but the bear is smelling something and walks in a certain direction. He stops at a place and Suzum asks where they are. Yusato explains this was Blurin's home before his parents were killed by a giant snake. Yusato feels sad for the little bear, but Blurin comes to him making them confused. Yusato thinks Blurin wants to go, and Suzum is impressed the bear already made his decision. She explains that Blurin knows that he belongs by Yusato's side. Blurin starts walking away and Suzum tells Yusato it's time to return home. Upon returning, the king welcomes Yusato and Suzum back. Suzum apologizes for worrying him, but he claims he's the one who must apologize for putting Yusato into this. Yusato dismisses it and confuses the king by mentioning that he's already used to these types of situations. Our boy quickly realizes he made a mistake and looks at Rose. He tries to explain himself and lies by saying that he used to explore the woods in their previous world. The king believes it and decides to ask about his training with the rescue squad. Yusato looks at Rose again, thinking that's hard to answer. Yet, he claims that it's way too easy. The king is happy to hear it, but Rose smirks at Yusato. He starts to panic and realizes that's what she wants him to answer. He realizes that his mind has been pressured by Rose and feels frustrated. Yet, the king announces that Suzum's training will be modified and asks her to rest for the day. The two are dismissed, but Rose and Sigli's are asked to stay behind. Yusato is confused, but he's forced to leave. Suzum asks if something is wrong, and he replies that he's wondering about the subject they're talking about because the minister seemed worried. Suzum confirms, and Yusato worries that he might get fired. She laughs it out and suddenly stops after hearing Kazuki's voice. Kazuki immediately complains about Yusato being too casual after being attacked by monsters and going missing. 
Yuzato apologizes, and the princess explains that Kazuki wanted to look for them. Suzum calls him reckless, but Yuzato mentions she's the same after being bitten by a poisonous monkey. Kazuki is confused, and Yuzato tries to explain, but Suzum stops him. They head outside and Kazuki reveals Rose's claims that there was no need to worry because Yusato was with Suzio. He mentions those words calmed him down, but Yusato knows that Rose was thinking that he was having it on easy mode when compared to training. Kazuki is impressed because Rose completely trusts Yusato. Yet, Yusato thinks that Kazuki is just a pure and innocent guy. He places his hand on his shoulder, asking him to never change. After all, only he and Suzio need to be corrupted. Kazuki doesn't understand it, but accepts the deal. Suzum, however, starts to complain because he just called her tainted. Later, Yusato and Suzum leave, and the princess mentions how close they look together. Kazuki confirms, mentioning they are getting pretty close lately. Yet, the princess corrects him, mentioning they're close to him. She mentions how he was enjoying himself while hanging with them. Kazuki dismisses it by mentioning they were friends before. The princess gets worried and asks if she can also be Kazuki's friend. She mentions that Suzum treats her informally, but Kazuki never calls her by her name. Upon noticing his surprised reaction, the princess apologizes and tells him to not force himself. Kazuki then grows a pair and promises to call her Celia from now on. Meanwhile, in the throne room, the king reveals he interrogated the bandits who attacked Yuzato's group. In short, the bandits were crossing the plains and noticed fewer monsters than usual, and that's when they were attacked by a herd of fall boars in the forest. The king thinks the monsters must be fleeing the plains for the forest. And that can only mean the monsters are running away from something that is coming towards the kingdom. Sigles thinks it's the demon lord's army, and the king confirms it. Sigles then mentions the demon lord underestimated them in their previous battle, but the same won't happen again. He believes the demon lord will use everything available to capture their kingdom. The king confirms and asks him to tell all commanding officers to be prepared to mobilize the troops at any time. Sigles confirms and starts walking away. The king then decides to talk to Rose in private. He apologizes for the wait and reveals that he must ask her for something. He explains that he normally cannot assign this mission to the captain of the rescue squad, but Rose replies that he doesn't need to worry about it. She knows he wants her to scout and locate the location of the demon lord's army. The king confirms and apologizes for the request. She dismisses the apology because she knows she's the fastest person in the kingdom. She prepares to leave, but the king reveals he has something else to talk about. He steps down from his throne and asks if she wants to return to her position as the battalion commander. Yet, Rose refuses to, mentioning that she bears more guilt than he thinks she does. The king thinks she's too hard on herself and mentions she was the first healer to ever be appointed as a battalion commander. However, Rose replies that it's simply the truth. He asks if she has ever forgiven herself, and she denies it. Her eyes become filled with rage as she asks how she could ever forget it. She was forced to accept the deaths of all her subordinates and the fact that she couldn't revive them. And the scar on her right, I will never enable her to forget them. The king tries to convince her that she shouldn't bear this burden, but she replies that it's something she must do. Her subordinates only died because she was full of herself. However, that made her realize that it's all over when someone is dead, no matter how skilled or trustworthy they are. And that scar is a punishment that will never let her forget about her sins. She reveals that was the origin of her decision to create the rescue squad. They don't fight, they save lives. The king confirms by stating they saved many men during the battle two years ago. He asks her if she hasn't reached her goal, but Rose reveals there's another reason why the squad exists. The king is curious and asks what's the reason. Rose reveals that her ultimate goal is to find a subordinate who will not die. The king feels stupid because that's something impossible. Yet Rose explains that's the reason for her hellish training. She's been looking for someone who can use healing magic, someone who's determined to push past his physical limits, and someone with the determination to never give up. She's been looking for someone who has all of these traits. The king realizes Yusato is just like that, Rose confirms, mentioning he's everything she's been looking for. He has insane survival instincts, adaptability, and the will to survive. She mentions that his best trait is that he hates to lose, and his worst one is that he can be easily influenced. Yet, no matter what she does, he still gets back up and stands up to her. She knows he will never give up and reminds him of the guys she lost. She reveals that she's determined to make him the strongest healer. She realizes that she spoke too much and apologizes. 
she decides to focus on the mission instead, and the king puts his confidence on her. Later at night, Yusato finds a letter and asks about it. The squad member explains Rose left it for him before leaving. Yusato thinks this is bad news and sits down to open it. He finds out that he doesn't need to train the next day and that he should deliver another letter to someone. Yusato then asks where Rose went, but nobody knows. She simply told them that she was going out and wouldn't return for dinner. Meanwhile, the Demon Lord's army is trying to make a bridge to cross the river. The Black Knight sighs making the commander question what's wrong. The Black Knight thinks it's quite annoying to see the commander's excitement about all of this. The commander gets angry complaining that this isn't the way to talk to a superior, but the Black Knight bluntly apologizes, mentioning they're literally the same rank. The commander mentions she doesn't care because she's the one in charge and the Black Knight should follow orders. The Black Knight apologizes and walks away, asking to be informed when the bridge is completed. Four Eyes Weirdo mentions how the commander is struggling but tells him to do something. He tells her that he's giving moral support and that the bridge construction is going fine. The commander confirms it and mentions that in a few hours they will start their invasion. Yet suddenly someone mentions there is someone on the other side of the river. She thinks it's just a scout and couldn't care less because it will be too late to return to the kingdom and inform what's going on. Suddenly, a tree is thrown into the bridge that is being constructed. It completely destroys it, shocking the commander who doesn't understand what's going on. But upon looking closely, she notices Rose standing on the other side and shouts her name. Rose smiles, thinking she was supposed to only scout, but she managed to delay the invasion by some days. The next day, Yusato follows Rose's map to deliver the letter. Yet he notices everyone is looking and commenting about him. He doesn't understand why because he didn't bring Blurin with him, but everyone is confused about why is Yusato walking instead of running. He then meets the old lady who asks where Blurin is and if he wants to buy some fruits. Yusato confirms it and mentions that he will be picking it up on his way back. He finally manages to find the place on the map and steps inside. A girl comes to greet him and upon noticing his clothes, asks if he's the person who just joined the rescue squad. Yusato confirms, but she interrupts him by mentioning that her brother already told her his name. Yet, every time she tries, she guesses it wrong. Yusato tells her his name and she then introduces herself as Yururu Fleur, Orga's sister. She then welcomes him to their clinic and Yusato asks where is Orga. She reveals he's inside examining a patient and convinces him to peek inside. Yusato doesn't know if they should be doing it, but she reveals that Orga needs to concentrate. They watch Orga use his healing magic on a kid, and Yusato notices that his healing magic color is intense and smooth, which is the exact opposite of his. Organa finishes healing the kid, who gets up and tells his mother that he doesn't feel sick anymore. The mother thanks Orga, but the kid asks him why people are watching. Upon noticing it's Yusato, Orga ends the deal, and they talk. Orga thanks him for delivering Rose's letter, but Yusato dismisses it, mentioning that he always wanted to visit the clinic. Yururu then asks how everyone in the squad is doing. He confirms it's always the same thing, and she laughs it out mentioning how she misses them. Orga starts reading the letter while Yururu tells Yusato that she and her brother couldn't keep up with the training. She still feels bad because Rose has put everything into training them, but thinks didn't work out. Everyone was initially excited but the training was so hard that they became afraid of Rose. She mentions that Rose was desperate at that time. Yusato is confused by those words, but Yururu explains that Rose seems much happier right now. He thinks that's only because she managed to find a new punching bag. Suddenly, someone comes into the clinic to ask for Orga's help because someone fell from a roof while fixing it and injured two other people. Yusato joins the siblings and they reach the location. Orga thinks they need to treat them urgently and asks Yusato to take care of someone. They quickly rush to their patients and Yusato teats a guy with a broken bleeding leg. He thinks that he only healed basic injuries on himself, Orga, and Suzium before. However, if war breaks out, he will have to treat injuries more severe than this in the middle of the battle. He knows that he trained for that moment, yet he's still unsure. Orga notices this and tells him to calm down. He explains it doesn't matter who or where he's treating because he has the power to heal them. He tells Yusato that he believes in him, and Yusato remembers Kazuki mentioning that Rose believes in him. He finally makes up his mind and decides to believe in himself. He focuses on his magic and quickly heals the leg of the injured guy. While returning to the clinic, Orga thanks him for helping, but Yusato is unsure if he did a good job. Yoruru confirms it, mentioning the patient was surprised to not feel more pain. 
Orga uses this chance to ask Yusato to drop by the clinic when he has time and help them. Yusato takes the offer and decides to leave. While saying goodbye, Yuru mentions that Orga looked cool while advising Yusato. He then reveals that Rose's letter is a summoning for them to join the war against the Demon Lord's army. He then explains that Yusato doesn't have any real experience and can only rely on his abilities. Yururu realizes the war is about to start and feels sad. Meanwhile, Yusato manages to get the fruit from the old lady when he's suddenly stopped by a girl with fox ears. He's confused and asks if she's lost. She replies that he's the only one who can see it and the only person who can change the future. He notices the girl's eyes changing colors and starts watching images of the war. In those images, the Demon Lord's army is winning. He then sees Suzume and Kazuki losing their lives to the Black Knight. Yuzato returns to reality, completely shocked, and the girl replies that he, he must repay her in the future. Yusato is staring at the sky subconsciously. He gets back to the present and he tells the girl to wait up. He chases after her, wondering what he just saw. He wonders why he saw Inukami and Kazuki get defeated in battle. He decides to ask the girl about it, but he loses track of her. The girl is hiding in a building. She hopes Yusato does something to change the future. Yusato asks Thomas, a guard, if he saw any fox girl run across the street, but the guard tells him he didn't see her. Yusato knows that the girl couldn't have gone far since she's very little. He's frustrated that he lost track of her and the commotion attracts the attention of Rose. Thomas runs back to his post at the sight of Rose and Yusato isn't surprised, he's still afraid of her because he understands why. This pisses Rose off and she covers Yusato's face with her hands and dangles him like a rag doll. Yusato cries out in pain and Rose asks him to repeat his statement. Yusato tells her he didn't say anything and he asks her where she has been. She lets him go and tells him she just took a short trip to scout around the border. She tells him she went to scout because the Demon Lord's army was trying to cross the river by building a bridge. Yusato thinks war will break out soon, but she tells him she destroyed the bridge so they'll be fine in the meantime. Yusato asks her where she went scouting in the story and she's pissed off. She grabs his head and dangles him once again, and Yusato begs for mercy. On their way back to the kingdom, Yusato tells Rose about the fox beast man girl, and Rose seems familiar with her. Yusato asks her if she knows the fox girl, but Yusato tells her she doesn't know her personally. She tells Yusato the girl appeared in the village two years ago, and she was about 12 years old. Rose was surprised that she was able to make it to the village by herself, evading all the kidnappers and bandits along the way. Yusato is surprised by this, but Rose tells him demi-humans are very valuable to kidnappers. Demi-humans aren't just prized for their unique appearance. Some of them also have a mastery of rare magic. Yusato asks her if that includes showing someone a vision, and she asks him what kind of vision. Yusato wonders how he'll explain what he saw. He tells Rose the vision was like a nightmare that showed a future he hopes never comes to pass. Rose tells him some beast men can use the magic of precognition, but they're extremely rare. She tells him such beastmen would typically be well guarded back in the beastlands. She asks him why his sudden interest in beast men, and he tells her he was reading it in a book. Yusato wonders if the fox girl is one of the beastmen who can see the future. Rose walks past the path they usually take back home, and Yusato wonders why Rose is going. She tells him she's going to see King Lloyd, and she asks him to head back first. Rose reports back to the king, and he apologizes for putting her in harm's way. He thanks her for stalling the enemy's advance, but she tells him they'll be working on a new bridge, which will be completed soon. The king knows they will build a new bridge and eventually begin their invasion. He decides to inform the soldiers and citizens of the impending invasion. He orders Sergio to begin the process, and he tells Siglis to inform Suzun and Kazuki that he wants a word with them before the night ends. Suzun and Kazuki are informed of the king's summons, and they make their way to the throne room. Kazuki wonders why they were summoned by the king, but Suzun knows they were summoned because of the impending invasion. They bump into Celia, and Suzun greets her. Celia returns her greetings, and she greets Kazuki as well. Kazuki stutters to answer her greetings because he's embarrassed. She tells them to go see her father because he's waiting. Suzun tells her they will see her later. They leave towards the throne room and Suzun asks Kazuki if something happened between him and Celia. Kazuki denies any interaction with her and Suzun believes him. They arrive at the door to the throne room and they're let in. Meanwhile, Tong is snoring away on his bed, but Yuzato can't sleep because of the vision. He's not sure he can change it since it's a vision of the future. 
He remembers the girl telling him he can change that future, and he wonders if he can really stop it from happening. He's now convinced that the girl wants him to change the future, but he doesn't know how to go about that. Suddenly, light comes through his window, and he looks outside to see some orbs dancing outside. He's so shocked he thinks it's a ghost. The orbs suddenly disappear, and he gets out of bed to check his window. He looks out to see Kazuki standing outside and waving at him. He goes out to meet him, and he tells him he didn't expect him to visit him at such late hours. Kazuki apologizes for this, remembering that Yusato has to get up to train. Yusato tells him not to worry about that because he wasn't getting any sleep anyway. Yusato tells Kazuki he can't sleep in two because of his reputation as the hero, but Kazuki doesn't look happy. Yusato asks him why he has a long face, and Kazuki tells him they were summoned by the king who told them they'll have to battle the demon lord's army soon. Kazuki was expecting it, and he wasn't surprised, and he could see that Suzune was itching to get into battle. But when Kazuki pictured himself in battle, he couldn't sleep so he left the castle to come see Yusato. He tells Yusato he ran away because he's too scared to fight. He tells Yusato that when he first fought monsters for real, he was really scared and his legs froze up at the sight of the monsters eh. The monsters put up a formidable resistance and when Kazuki finally defeated them, he realized how lightly he had been taking everything. He knows the demon lord's army will come at him with everything they've got and that scares the mess out of him. He knows that the people of the kingdom are counting on him, but he can't stand it. Yusato tells Kazuki he's a cool guy because he always knows what to do and never gets scared. Kazuki tells him he does get scared, and Yusato tells him it's understandable because the expectations of people have been a burden on him. Yusato tells him he doesn't have to keep living up to those expectations. He tells him it's all right for him to put himself first sometimes. Kazuki asks Yusato how he feels about the impending invasion, and Yusato tells him he would be going to fight, which surprises him. He tells Kazuki he wants to save those who will fight the Demon Lord's army. Kazuki asks him if he isn't scared. Yuzato tells him he's scared, but it doesn't change his decision. Kazuki tells him his decision can lead to his death. He tells Yuzato he was dragged into everything by accident. Yuzato tells him though he got there by accident, he has experienced a lot of things and met people who have accepted him. He tells Kazuki he wants to help those people and he's obviously one of them. He tells Kazuki it doesn't matter if he fights or not, he'll always remain his friend. Kazuki gives himself a resounding slap to renew his resolve. He tells Yuzato he has been foolish, and he decides to fight to protect Yuzato and Suzune. He tells Yuzato that even if he can't fight as a hero, he'll fight nonetheless because he wants to help his friends. Yuzato asks him if he's sure about his decision, and Kazuki tells him he can't just sit still after Yuzato resolved to fight. He tells Yuzato he'll charge ahead and use his fear as motivation to fight harder. Yusato asks him if he's really sure, and he tells Yusato when he thinks of them fighting alongside him, he can't help but feel reassured. Yusato is glad to hear this, and they both decide to fight together to protect the kingdom and everyone they love. Kazuki is really glad he met Yusato, and he thanks him for everything. He bids Yusato goodnight and begins to walk back to the castle. Yusato is glad he was able to help. Someone arrives just as Kazuki leaves, but Yusato doesn't see them. He's about to go back inside and hit the sheets, but Suzune teases him about his bromance with Kazuki. Yusato begs her to let it go because he's very sleepy, but she's surprised he's not interested in why she came to see him. Yusato tells her he already figured out that she noticed Kazuki acting weird, so she followed him to see where he goes. Suzune tells him he's correct, and she tells him she doesn't have to do anything about Kazuki's situation because he handled it properly. Yusato tells her he's still skeptical about letting Kazuki fight. Suzune grabs his shoulders and asks him if she shouldn't fight too. He tells her she's in a different situation because she already made up her mind to live in that world. Suzune agrees with him and decides to head back to the castle because the next day is going to be very busy. The next day, the king announces that the demon lord's army was spotted by the border and they would invade the kingdom anytime soon. He tells the soldiers the plan is to intercept them at the grasslands. He reminds the soldiers that they successfully repelled the Demon Lord's army previously. He tells them the army would have been reinforced, and it may not be easy to repel them this time. He tells them they've also been strengthened because they now have both Suzun and Kazuki who pledged allegiance to them. He tells them they also have the rescue squad who were vital to their previous victory. He tells the people he's not worried because he's sure they'll be victorious since they have fearless soldiers. He tells the soldiers that they will battle the next day and they will definitely win. 
The soldiers are hyped up by the king's speech, and Yuzato is pleased to see this. Kazuki goes to Celia's room to see her, and her maid lets him in. He apologizes to Celia for visiting her unannounced, and she tells him she's glad he did. She knows he'll be going into battle, and he tells her he will be leaving the next day. She tells him she will pray for his safety, and he promises to protect the country from the Demon Lord's army. He tells her he will be coming back to her, and she wishes him good luck, hoping he comes back safely. Yusato takes Yuru to see his Blurin. It looks so cute she wants to pet him. Yusato tells her the Blurin may not let her pet it, but she tells him she's good with animals. She reaches her hand out to pet him, and the Blurin smacks her hand away which surprises her. Yusato explains that the Blurin doesn't like new people. She tries again but gets rejected. Kikuru hops on her shoulder and she thinks it'll comfort her, but it sides with the Blurin and she's dejected, wondering why she's been rejected on all fronts. Orga tries taking some luggage into the house, but he's flattened under the weight of it, so Yuzato rushes to his aid. He apologizes for causing him trouble, but Yuzato tells him not to worry about it. He tells Yuzato that Yuru is pretty nervous because it's her first time in battle, so she's trying to deal with it by interacting with the animals. Suddenly, Tong opens the door and tells him the captain wants to see him in her quarters. Yuzato hasn't been called up to her room before, and he wonders if she's finally going to torture him to death. Yusato knocks on Rose's door, and she tells him to enter. She's holding a box on her desk, and Yuzato walks up to her. He asks her why she was looking for him, and she tells him they need to talk. She asks him if he remembers his role on the battlefield, and he tells her his role. She tells him he's correct, but they won't go by that strategy at the beginning. She tells him Tong and some others will bring the wounded to the back line, so they can heal them along with Yururu and Orga. Yusato asks her why they won't be at the front line, and she tells him she doesn't want them to be sitting ducks because there won't be a lot of wounded at the start of battle. She tells him once they're on the front lines, he shouldn't be healing the wrong people, and Yuzato thinks she's talking about the enemy. She tells him he shouldn't heal everybody he sees. She asks him what would happen if he heals someone who's still fighting, and he figures out that he'll just be getting in the fighter's way. She tells him to use his intuition to decide who he'll heal at a moment's notice. She pushes the box to him, and she tells him to look inside. He takes off the lid, and he sees his rescue squad uniform. Rose tells him it's made to help him stand out on the battlefield, and she asks him to wear it. Yusato gladly puts it on, and Rose tells him it fits him perfectly because he has been working out. Rose sternly warns him that healers are not immortal, and he shouldn't take his life for granted under any circumstance. He tells her he already knows that, and he doesn't plan on dying. She tells him talk is cheap, but she has seen people say those same words and lose their lives in battle. She tells him he also has to save himself despite being in the rescue squad. She tells him if he pulls any self-sacrifice stunts, she'll take his life before the enemy does. He promises to save himself and everyone around him. She asks him if he can actually do that, and he reminds her that she told him to always speak his ideals. She tells him not to forget his words, and he thanks her. He leaves the room, and he remembers his vision. He doesn't know if it was the future he saw, but he knows he can't let Kazuki or Suzun lose their life in battle. The army is making its way to the battlefield. Amako isn't too pleased that the journey is taking so long. Tong tells her they have no choice because they have to go far away from the castle to fight the demons. Amako gets his point, but Orga doesn't look too happy about the journey as well. Yusato asks Rose to tell him about demons. She tells him demons are demi-humans with unusually large horns. They look like humans at first glance, but they are superior in both strength and magic. She tells him the demon commanders are very powerful, but the common demon soldiers are push-offs. She wonders if the thought of demons scares Yusato, but he tells her he's fine because he knows someone scarier than the demons. Rose is impressed with how far he has come despite the circumstance of his choosing. Yusato tells her he's just doing everything he can to prove her wrong. This enrages Ross, and Yuzato puts up his hands thinking she will hit him, but she doesn't retaliate. Rose feels nostalgic remembering her previous squad. Five years in the past, Rose walked towards the King's Hall. The King was addressing the soldiers and telling them about the demons that were spotted on a plane close to the city. He told them it was only a matter of time before the demons attacked someone. He decided to assign guards to the merchants that traverse the plains. He tells them the guards will be assigned to soldiers lower than the general rank. He warns them to run if a fight breaks out because demons are stronger than humans. After the briefing, Sigles asks Rose what she thinks the demons are planning. 
She tells him he has no idea, but she guessed they are preparing for an invasion. Sigles wonders if they have the means, and she tells him there's a possibility. Sigles tells her he'll ready the troops to mobilize at a moment's notice, but she tells him it would be a waste of time. He tells her they need to be able to mobilize instantly, and she tells him he's too uptight. They go their separate ways and Rose decides to take his advice. Owl, her subordinate, calls out to her while she's thinking about her strategy, but she's lost in thought and doesn't answer. Owl keeps pestering her and she loses her patience. She hits Owl's head and tells her to be quiet. Owl complains that she almost split her head like a coconut with her brute strength. Rose tells her to keep quiet when she sees other people thinking and Owl realizes that she's mean. She tells Rose that she didn't think demons would show up, and this prompts Rose to give her a two-for-one special smacking. She tells her she shouldn't listen in on classified information. She tells her to learn to stick to the rules. Owl wonders what the demons are up to and Rose tells her no one knows. Owl tells her all they have to do is drive the demons away if they invade and Rose warns her not to underestimate the demons. Owl tells her she's not underestimating them but Rose isn't convinced by her act. She tells Rose she bests those principles into her and Rose decides to oversee her training that afternoon. Owl tries to talk her out of it. She tells her she doesn't want to keep her busy since she's a commander now. They arrive at the squad barracks and everyone greets Rose, who is their captain and Owl, who is their vice captain. They notice Owl looks pale and they wonder why. Owl tries to hide it, but Rose tells them she's going to retrain all of them and they all get pissed at Owl. They think Owl said something to Rose to prompt her action, and she tells them it's her gift to them because they have been slacking off. They proceed to mess her up and Rose walks away without caring. Owl begs her to intervene but Rose tells her it's none of her business. After a week, the king calls Rose for a private meeting and they meet on the balcony. He tells her the demons have been attacking other monsters in the territory. He tells her eyewitnesses saw a group of trained demon soldiers perpetrate the act. Rose is surprised that the attack was planned and coordinated. She becomes suspicious and the king tells her to find out the reason for the demon's actions. He authorizes her to use force if the need arises. He's sure she won't act harshly unless need be and she's grateful for his trust in her. She promises to deliver good results. Later in the day, she briefs her squad and tells them they would be heading into the darkness of Linger. She tells them they would depart the next day. One of the soldiers asks her how many demons they would be expecting, and she tells him about 30 have been sighted. Another soldier thinks fighting 30 demons would be problematic. Owl tries to cheer the squad up, but they're still pissed off at her for making them train harder the past week. She tells them the training made them well-toned for the mission, but they throw several utensils at her. Rose decides to make her cat stay home. The cat can detect monsters, and she knows it could be useful, but she doesn't want the demons to target it. She didn't want to put the cat in danger. Owl rushes to her side for protection, and the soldiers stop pummeling her. Rose tells the squad they will need to be at their very best for the mission so she'll tag along. The soldiers are hyped because they know they'll be unstoppable with Rose leading them. They know they don't have to worry about getting hurt because Rose can always heal them up. They decide to go all out for the mission. Owl riles up the group once again and this time they are hyped. Rose tells them to quit the chit chat and start preparing. The next day they venture out for their mission. They searched around the linger but they couldn't find any demons. As darkness descends they make a campfire. Owl tells them they will search the western side of the forest the next day. The soldiers know the western terrain isn't very good so Owl tells them they would leave the horses behind. The soldier tells her they need to prioritize the areas they can search with horses, but Owl tells them she's sure there's something in the west. The soldiers decide to follow her lead. She tells them to take turns watching guard while others sleep but they all go to sleep. Rose takes the first watch so she tells Owl to get some sleep. While everyone is sleeping, Rose notices that Owl is having trouble sleeping. She offers to put Owl to sleep herself and Owl is surprised she noticed she can't sleep. Owl joins her by the fire and she decides to confide in her. She asks Rose why she chose to make her the vice captain. She tells Rose she's average compared to the other soldier and she knows nothing stands out about her. Rose realizes that she thinks she's not qualified for the role. Owl tells Rose she doesn't need a vice captain because she handles most things by herself. Rose tells her someone has to do the menial jobs and she's doing well because there have been no complaints about her. Owl tells her it's because she has been working hard and Rose tells her if she keeps working hard, she may become the captain. 
Rose reminds her that she can't keep being the captain of the squad now that she's a battalion commander. Owl protests that she can't become captain because everyone in the squad will end up taking each other's lives. She tells Rose she'll get beaten up and Rose is disappointed by her lack of faith in the squad. Owl tells her she doesn't want her to ever leave the squad and Rose sighs in exasperation. Owl tells her she never follows orders she doesn't agree with and she always does what she feels is right even if everyone else disagrees. She tells Rose she'll shut up anyone who doesn't agree with her with force and Rose tells her she's quite famous for that. She tells her she heard of stories of a skillful soldier who was so stubborn she wouldn't obey the orders of a general. That was when Rose came into Owl's life. Owl was thinking of doing the same thing and disobeying Rose's orders, but nothing she tried worked. Whenever she disobeyed, Rose always put her in her place, and she had no choice but to follow orders. At that time, Owl decided she won't give in to Rose and obey her. She decides to endure her hellish training just to prove her point. Rose remembered Owl becoming motivated all of a sudden, but she doesn't remember treating her any different. Owl tells her she became motivated because Rose didn't cast her out or turn her back on her. Other captains usually got tired of her and would turn back on her, but Rose kept facing her head on. Owl tells her it was annoying, but she felt happy, and she's convinced the other soldiers also felt happy. She tells Rose no one else can be their captain, because no one else understands them like she does. Rose walks up to her and gives her a spank on her head. She tells her to grow up and stop relying on her for everything. Owl is surprised by her reaction to her heartfelt confession. Rose tells her she won't pick someone who isn't qualified to replace her. She tells Owl she didn't pick her as the vice captain on a whim. She realized that Owl never gave up once she made up her mind, and she always stood strong regardless of the situation. She knows these qualities will motivate those around her to surpass their limits. She tells her to just be herself and people will follow her without question. Owl is shocked that Rose thinks people will follow her lead, but Rose is surprised she doesn't know the power of her charisma. Rose tells her change is the only constant in the world. She tells her she needs to accept change and move forward regardless. She tells her nothing will change the fact that she was their captain. She tells her not to worry herself unnecessarily. Rose decides to get some sleep and Owl offers to take the next watch. Rose tells the other soldiers to get some sleep and Owl is surprised. They tell her they trust her to lead them in Rose's absence. They tell her they don't hate her and they always listen to her commands when it counts. They tell her not to worry not to worry so much and she becomes embarrassed. She chases them about and Rose smiles secretly. The next day, they climb up a little mountain and a soldier spots evidence of the demons. He informs Rose and they come forward to investigate. The soldiers realize the demons are hunting monsters and they wonder why they're hunting monsters instead of humans. Owl knows there must be a deeper reason behind it, but they suddenly hear a deep growl from within the forest. Rose tells them to get ready to battle, and they rush into the forest. They see the demons in a clearing. They just took down a glow wolf and were in the middle of packing them. They remain hidden behind the bushes, but the chief demon senses their presence and informs the other demons. They reveal themselves and Rose tells Owl not to make a move yet. Rose walks out and she asks the demon what he's doing in their territory. Both sides are tensed up and ready to fight. The demon tells her he doesn't like his mission, but it benefits them in the long run. She asks him the details of his mission, but he doesn't reveal it to her. She tells him he can avoid a fight if he turns tail and runs, but he's pissed off by her arrogance. The demon can see that Rose is strong, but he can't let her go because she knows about their mission. The demon promises to take their lives. Rose puts Owl in charge of the squad because she would be facing the chief demon. The demon knows only one of them will come out alive and Rose dares him to take her life. They engage in battle and Owl leads the other soldiers against the lesser demons. The demon creates an armor of wind and he sends wind slashes at Rose, but she dodges it. She gets up close with him and tries to punch him, but his shield blocks it. The demon is surprised she was able to dodge his attack and he tries to engage in talk no jutsu, but Rose shuts him up with a leg strike. He blocks it, but she follows up with another strike. Rose gets a cut, and she leaves her team in peel care to take in the demon. The demon tries to hide in the first and launch a sneak attack, but Rose eventually finds him. She hurls a huge tree at him as he flees to block his way, and then hurls several others, but he shields himself. She brings one more tree down on him, but he cuts through it. Rose keeps attacking him, but his wind shield blocks all her strikes. 
He's impressed with her strength, and he tells her she's the most powerful human he has ever fought. He suddenly surrounds her with wind blades, but she walks through it, and he's surprised to see she has healing magic. She attacks him again, but he blocks it. He can now see she's a one-man army, and he decides to introduce himself as Nero. He summons his sword from the abyss and vows to put an end to Rose. Rose tells him she would beat the crap out of him before that happens. A fierce battle between both of them commences. Rose's soldiers think the demons are quite powerful, but they realize they are more powerful. They can subdue some of the demons while they defeat the others in the name of their captain. Rose is still engaged in a fierce battle with Nero. He tries to hurt her with his sword, but she blocks it and jumps back to put some distance between them. She can see the sword is imbued with a curse, so she decides to try her best not to be hit by it. Nero rushes at her, but she blocks his attack and counters it with a punch. She lands another punch that sends him flying towards the other demons. Rose follows him, but she's surprised to see him sitting still on the ground because she knows her punch didn't do much. She orders him to get back on his feet, and he laughs at her insolence. The demon leader is pissed that their monster hunting expedition has gone awry. The sight of his subordinates' lifeless bodies doesn't give him pleasure. He decides to praise Rose's soldiers for their grit, and he confesses they are the most powerful opponents he has ever faced. Rose thanks him for his compliment, but he tells her humans no longer have heroes who wield exceptional power which surprises her. Rose wonders if the demons thought they would be able to beat the humans because they don't have heroes anymore. She tells him not to take humans so lightly, and he tells her his mind has been changed. He realized that humans have now become the greatest obstacle that can prevent demons from achieving their ultimate goal. Rose wonders what their ultimate goal is and Nero tells her the era of demons living in fear of humans will soon be over. He tells her the demon king will soon rise again. He tells her he would be cruel and merciless to the humans, but he will remain merciful and benevolent to the demons. Nero's body becomes covered with a red and black aura, which surprises Rose. He tells her the demon king promised to bring them victory, but he has to take her life at that moment for the king to be able to bring peace to their kind. The demons are no longer scared to lose their lives for their cause. One of Rose's soldiers strikes a demon with her sword, but the demons are not unaffected by it. The demon latches onto her, and she wonders how he's that strong. He tells her the demons would drag them down with them regardless of the state of their body. Rose tries to rush to her aid, but Nero starts attacking her. The demon takes out one soldier to the surprise of the others, and Rose is stunned as well. They wonder how the demons can move after they knock them out. The demons begin taking down the soldiers one by one, and they realize the demons no longer care for their lives. One of the soldiers tries to calm the rest down, but they are too scared to listen. The demons keep taking down the soldiers and Rose realizes she won't be able to help them in time. Nero tells her he would have to transform into a real demon to defeat her. Nero was forcing his men to take their own lives, while also distracting Rose by putting her soldiers in a sticky situation. Rose rushes at him to try to get him out of her way, but he dodges her attacks and strikes her with his sword. The strike takes her right eye, and Nero tells her he can predict her moves from a mile away. Rose tells him his strike was just scratch, but when she tries to use her healing magic, it doesn't work. Nero tells her his sword nullifies all magic by inflicting a temporary curse on anything it cuts. He tells her her healing magic won't work on her wounds. Her soldiers call out to her and beg her to use her healing magic to heal their wounds, but she's powerless. Rose tries to fight Nero, but he dodges her attack easily. He tells her she's in no position to fight because her vision is impaired and she's not in an optimal state. He tells her he's going to put an end to her and Rose can see she has lost her depth perception. She submits herself to her fate as Nero brings his sword down on her. Owl comes out of nowhere and takes the attack for her which surprises Rose. Rose looks around to see her soldiers lying lifeless on the forest floor. She remembers when they promised to fight alongside her because she made them look invincible. They had so much faith that she would be able to heal their wounds if they got injured so they promised to go all out. Rose can see that they believed they would be safe with her and she would protect. She wonders why Owl didn't run to save her life. She's convinced she wouldn't have been cut down if she did. Rose realizes she is too weak and that she puts too much faith in her abilities. Nero tells her he will never forget the losses on both sides to honor her. He decides to put an end to her, but she catches his crimson sword which surprises him. Rose gives him a ferocious punch to his face which sends him down on one knee. She tells him he can't remember her soldiers because he knows nothing about them. She lands more punches on him which sends him flying. She's pissed he sacrificed his men in a suicide attack. 
He tries to run away, but she grabs him and smashes him on the ground repeatedly. She tells him he has no right to sympathize with her because he doesn't value his men. She throws him into the air and kicks him down, but she rushes down and punches him before he lands. She throws his crimson sword at him, which pins him to a tree. She promises to take his life, but a little girl demon named Amelia suddenly comes out of the forest and offers to help Nero, which surprises Rose. Nero is surprised, she showed herself after he told her to remain in hiding. She tells him she can't just leave him like that, and Rose is surprised one of his subordinates is saving him just like Owl saved her even after he sacrificed the others. Amelia helps Nero up, and they begin to walk away, but Rose stops them. Amelia turns back and Rose sees Owl in her, and she can't do anything as she takes Nero to safety. Rose is so pissed that she smashes the ground in frustration. Owl whispers her name and she crawls over to meet her. Rose tells her she's coming to heal her, but Owl knows her healing magic won't work because the wound can't be healed. Rose tells her they won't know until she tries, but when she tries, it doesn't work. Owl tells her not to bother because she doesn't regret what she did. She was honored to fight alongside Rose and Rose doesn't want to let her go. Owl tells her they all felt the same way, and she tells her to always remain the captain they love and admire. Rose promises not to let her lose her life and Owl is proud she is their captain. She draws her lady breath and Rose is devastated by the passing of all her soldiers. Rose returns to the village and informs the king that the demon king will soon rise just as Nero told her. She tells him their monster hunting expeditions have something to do with the resurrection of the demon king. She completes her report and she decides to make a special request to the king. She asks to be relieved of her duties as a battalion commander and a knight. The king wonders if that's what she wants. She tells him she's no longer worthy to be a knight and she takes her leave from the throne room. The king watches her limp out of the room. As she's limping along the street, a couple stops her, wondering if she's Captain Rose. She confirms her identity and they tell her their son was under her command. They tell her the name of her son and she remembers him lying lifeless on the battlefield. She breaks the news to them and tells them it was her fault, but they thank her for bringing their son back so they could see him again. They tell her their son was quite the delinquent, but he began to brighten up after joining her squad which surprises her. This makes them feel indebted to her. Rose returns to the squad base and she looks at the flowers planted by her soldiers. She also sees their belongings strewn all around the base and she's overcome with grief. A month later, Sigles visits her because he knows the king visited her. She wonders why the king came all the way to see her and he tells her it's because she has kept to herself for a month. He wonders if the king tried to get her back into duty, but she tells him the king visited her for the same reason he did. They visited her to make sure she didn't join the demons. She tells him losing her life doesn't sound so bad to her, but Sigles walks up to her and tells her to snap out of her grief. She tells him not to be so worried because it was just a thought that crossed her mind. He lets her go and he notices that her wounds caused by the crimson sword are healing. She tells him the curse was only temporary and he wonders why she hasn't tried healing her right eye. Sigles leaves her purse and heads back to the castle. Rose didn't heal her right eye as proof of her sin for leading her soldiers to their deaths. She doesn't want to forget their deaths and she also doesn't want to take her life after Owl gave up hers to save it. She wonders what she'll live for and she considers plotting her revenge against Nero. She concludes that she can't live like that so she decides to take a moment to cool off. She walks into the dining room and sits by herself. She tries to relax, but she begins hearing the voices of her soldiers. She opens her eyes to see an illusion of her soldiers gathered around the dining table and eating a meal. She can see them laughing heartily and she's disappointed in how pathetic she has become. She wonders if she was always this frail. She wonders how her soldiers would react if they saw her like that and Owl tells her she owe would laugh at her because she's not being herself. Owl tells her everything changes eventually, and she has to accept that change and move on. She tells her nothing would change the fact that she was their captain, and she tells her not to worry herself anymore. Rose says it along with her, and Owl is glad she remembers her words from the night in the forest. She wonders if Rose remembers the last thing she said to her. She reminds her to stay the captain they love and cherish, and the other soldiers appear. They tell her to stop moping about, and they remind her of who she used to be. Rose realizes she was so focused on their death that she forgot that her soldiers always charged forward regardless of their condition. This brings her to tears, and she promises that is the last time she'll show weakness. She asks them to pardon her for the last time, and she promises not to stand still anymore. Owl disappears after hearing this and Rose gets to her feet. She promises to remain a captain they'll admire, and she rips off the bandage from her eye. 
She now knows what she must do. Since the war with the Demon King was looming, and she was sure countless soldiers would lose their lives, she decided to create an organization to save lives and prevent people from dying. She realizes she'll need five people joining her including two healers and one other person who is just like her. Someone who's not just a healer but can roam the battlefield and overcome any obstacle they may come across. Rose knows if she's able to find someone like that, she may be able to keep all the soldiers alive. She tells Yusato she's glad she found him and he's so surprised he almost jumps out of the carriage. Rose wonders why he's so surprised and he tells her he's surprised by her comment. She realizes he doesn't know how valuable he is. She tells him she can't just replace him with any trained healer. She tells him he's just like a clone of her who would be running around the battlefield because only two of them can use their healing magic to surpass their physical limits. Yusato now understands what she means. She tells him she has been looking for a healer like him. He was able to do things only she was able to, and she's convinced he'll survive the battle. Yusato is happy to hear this, and she informs him that they're almost at their location. The demons finish constructing the bridge, and they decide to begin the invasion. Amelia promises to win the battle for her master. She tells her main asset to run wild as much as he likes, and he tells her the battle will be short because they're fighting mere humans. Amelia warns him not to underestimate the humans because they have healers. The asset wonders why he has to be cautious of people who run away, but she tells him they're the real monsters. The asset is sure he'll enjoy himself and finally feel alive for the first time in a very long time. The humans set up camp with several barricades around to protect them through the night. Some soldiers are standing around talking while others are sleeping. Yusato steps out of his tent in the early hours of the morning to calm himself since that was the day of the battle. Inumaki suddenly calls out to him, and she's surprised he's wearing a matching outfit with Rose. Yusato wonders what she's doing outside so early, and she tells him she went out for a morning walk. She turns around to show him her armor, and she wonders what he thinks about it. Yusato isn't sure of what to say, and she pressures him to compliment her armor. She decides to tell him more about the armor, though he didn't tell her wants to know more about it. She tells him the armor boosts her lightning magic without hindering her magic. She shows off her joint movement, and Yusato can see she's really happy with how fitting the armor is. Yusato wonders if she prefers wearing armor to cute clothing, and she tells him she prefers cute stuff since she was cultivating cactuses at home to comfort herself. Yusato tells her cactuses aren't cute, and she asks him to be her object of comfort then. He tells her he's already lost her, but she tells him she knows he's just hiding his feelings. She asks him to be truthful to himself and stop being a tsundir, but he tries to calm her down. She pressures him to get along with her so they can always share their feelings with each other, but he begs her to stop. He tells her to communicate with words since that's what humans use, but she tells him actions speak louder than words sometimes. She corners him because she wanted to give him some action, but Yuzato calls out to Kazuki to save him. Kazuki immediately manifests and he holds Inumaki at bay. Yusato is surprised Kazuki came to his rescue, but Inumaki tells him to let her go. Kazuki tells her Siglis is calling them to assemble, and she tells him she'll only answer his summons after she makes Yusato her own. Yusato begs Kazuki to take her away, and he agrees to Yusato's request. Kazuki promises to return to Yusato and make him comfort her by force. Kazuki waves him goodbye, and he thanks him for saving him. Yusato looks at the sunrise, and he smiles in anticipation of the upcoming battle. Siglis gives Kazuki and Inumaki reports from the scouts. He tells them the Demon Lord army would be arriving at the battlefront soon. He tells them the mages will hit the enemy with a barrage of magic before both of them will engage them. He tells them to carve a path through the enemy lines to the enemy's general and take him down if possible. He tells them to do their best to bring back good news to the king. They stand outside the barricade awaiting the Demon King's forces. Inumaki tells Kazuki not to push himself too hard, but he tells her she doesn't have to worry about him because he'll be fine. Kazuki wonders why she's so worried that she has to distract herself with Yusato, and she's surprised he figured that out. She tells him that though she's worried, she also feels empowered. Kazuki realizes she's now different from the way she was back in their old world, and she tells him her old self is gone. She's happy Yusato accepts her for who she is now and Kazuki didn't know about that. He asks her to give him more details, but she tells him now is not the time to share such information. She promises to give him more details when they are safe and Kazuki realizes he'll only get more details if they make it through the battle. Inumaki tells him they definitely have to make it through the battle alone so she can share the story. Suddenly, something catches their attention from a distance. 
They keep looking, and they don't see anything, but they can feel the presence of the demons as they approach. The demon army suddenly comes into view and Inumaki orders the mages to ready their magic since they'll be making the first move. She wonders if Kazuki is ready, and he tells her he has no choice but to be ready. The mages ready their staff, and they all attack the demons with their magic spells. Kazuki is happy their attacks hurt the demon army, but when their view clears up, they realize the army was just an illusion. Kazuki wonders where the real army is when Sigles suddenly notices the demons coming from a direction without barricades. Kazuki and Inumaki rush over to that direction to intercept the demon army. Rose orders soldiers in her healing unit to head out into the battlefield and bring back anyone who's injured to her. She orders them to go and return back to her alive, and they rush towards the battlefield. Rose stations Orga and Yururu at the tent with a guard standing with them for protection. She tells them to make a run for it if anything happens. She tells Yusato they'll both head into the battlefield after some time elapses, but they would heal the wounded at the tent in the meantime. She orders everyone to their stations and Yusato wonders if Inumaki and Kazuki are alright. Yururu wonders if he's worried about his friends and he tells her he's worried. She tells him to take care of himself too since he'll be heading into the battlefield soon. One of Rose's soldiers return with some wounded, and they're shocked there are soldiers that are already wounded. Rose tells them to expect more wounded since they are at war, and she tells them to get to healing the soldiers. Yuzato looks at a soldier, and he sees her injuries are bad. He decides to heal her right away, while the soldiers are bringing in more wounded. She tells him a big snake blew her away, and Yuzato wonders if it's the same snake he saw in his vision. He decides to focus on healing the soldier first. Meanwhile in the battlefield, the soldiers are facing a giant snake. They can't believe the demons have such a huge snake at their disposal. They try to keep their guard up against the snake, but they are helpless against it. The demon asset is so disappointed in humans, he didn't see the need for him to be in the battlefield because they are so weak. A soldier charges him from behind and runs his sword through the demon asset. The soldier is happy, he took the asset down, but he's wounded. The demon is even more disappointed at how weak humans are. The soldier falls to the ground wondering how he was wounded so fatally. The asset removes the soldier's sword from his guts and his wounds heal up. The soldier tries to crawl back to camp and inform the soldiers about the demon asset. The asset is impressed by his tenacity, but he decides to put an end to him. He's suddenly distracted by sticky water, and when he looks back the soldier is gone. The soldier is saved by one of Rose's soldiers, and the asset wonders who the soldier is. The soldier remembers when Amilla told him about strong soldiers on the enemy side, and he realizes she was talking about soldiers like this. He's happy with how fun the enemies are making the battle. Lightning suddenly strikes behind him twice, and he decides to investigate what's going on in that area. Another healing corp returns a soldier, and the tent is almost overcrowded. Rose decides it's time for them to head into the battlefield, and she asks Yuzato if he's ready. Yuzato tells her he's ready because she has trained him to be her right-hand man. She's glad she doesn't have to worry about him, and Yusato is surprised she was worried at all. She leaves Olga and Yururu in charge of the healing tent, and they encourage her to heal up the soldiers in the battlefield. They leave the tent and Rose tells the guard to take care of the healers. They rush into battle and Rose tells Yusato she heard something from a soldier. She tells him about the demon asset who is a black knight with black armor that took down the soldier using peculiar magic. She warns him to be careful, and Yuzato remembers the Black Knight from his vision. He suddenly stops in his tracks and Rose wonders what is wrong with him, but he denies anything being wrong. She decides to give him one more piece of advice. She realizes that he can't take anyone's life, and he tells her his role is to save lives. She thinks he's an idiot for saying that at the face of death, and she decides to use her special techniques to cure his idiocy. She tells him how to defeat an enemy he had to take down by all means. Yuzato is marveled by the technique, and he wonders if she thought up that technique just for him. He thanks her for the free advice, and they decide to go separate ways. As Yuzato runs through the battlefield, he sees several bodies on the ground. He gets to the heat of battle, and he sees a demon about to finish a soldier off. He rescues the soldier and heals him quickly, but one of the demons intercepts him. The demon attacks him, but Yuzato dodges and keeps running while healing the soldier. Rose on the other hand is using demons as stepping stones to fly though the battlefield and heal soldiers who are hurt. Yuzato heals up the soldiers and he asks them to take a little rest or exit the battlefield if they can't continue. Inumaki clears out most of the front lines and she orders the commander to withdraw the injured soldiers from battle while she charges ahead. 
Kazuki joins up with her, and they decide to keep clearing the path to the general. Kazuki tells her about the giant snake, and they decide to take it down after completing their objective. Inumaki tells the soldiers to follow her, but the Black Knight suddenly marches up to her with some demons. Everyone is surprised by the Dark Knight's appearance. Inumaki realizes the knight is stronger than any demon they've faced so far, so she tells her soldiers to stay back. Her soldiers pay her no mind, and they charge toward the knight. She begs them to fall back, but they attack the knight with their spears. They think they've hurt the knight, and Kazuki wonders why the knight isn't resisting. Inumaki realizes the knight doesn't feel pain, and the knight attacks the soldiers. Inumaki begs them to fall back again, but they're suddenly wounded. Kazuki is about to attack the knight to get revenge from the soldiers, but Inumaki hits him which makes his attack graze the knight's shoulder. Kazuki wonders why she stopped him, and she tells him he shouldn't land a direct hit on the knight. She realizes the knight's uses reflect magic, and Kazuki suddenly gets injured on his shoulder. Inumaki is surprised that the reflected magic passed through his armor. She wonders if he's alright, and he tells her it was just a scratch. She's happy she was able to figure out that the knight's armor reflects any attack on it back to the attacker thanks to his rashness. The knight tells her no one has ever figured out his ability so fast before. He tells her not to run away from him because she seems very strong and intelligent. Musato is running through the battlefield when he suddenly gets flashbacks of his vision. He tries to use his healing magic to make it go away, but it doesn't help. A demon is about to take him down in his weakened state, but he gets to his feet. He keeps running, but he trips and falls, and the demon is about to attack him again, but the soldier he just healed saves him. He asks the soldier for the location of the heroes, and he tells him they are at the front lines. Yuzato decides to head to the front lines, and he hopes both Kazuki and Inumaki are still alive when he arrives. The soldiers are fighting the demons on the front lines, so Inumaki and Kazuki decide to take on the knight, while the other demons are distracted. Kazuki wonders what they can do against the knight since he reflects their attacks, but Inumaki tells him her plan. He thinks it would be too dangerous, but she tells him they'll have Yusato heal them if anything goes awry. The knight sees they're ready to battle him, and he engages them. They rush towards him while dodging his attack and Inumaki casts her magic which hits the ground and obstructs the knight's vision. They run into the dust and attack the knight, but he reflects their attacks. Inumaki was hoping the knight can't reflect attacks he can't see, but she was wrong. She suddenly notices the attack on the knight's back wasn't reflected, so she decides to give her strategy another try. The knight uses tentacles from its armor to attack them, but they dodge its attacks. Inumaki uses her lightning skill to increase her speed, and she moves behind the knight. Kazuki realizes her plan, and he decides to blind the knight. The knight is getting bored of their strategy, but Inumaki suddenly attacks him from behind, and the knight is hurt. Inumaki realizes the knight can't reflect an attack, he doesn't perceive. She tells Kazuki to attack the knight since he can't reflect the attack, but as soon as Kazuki attacks the knight, he triggers his reflect skill. Inumaki is surprised the knight was able to fool them into attacking him. The knight injured Kazuki while his reflect skill injured Inumaki. He tells Inumaki he fooled her into believing. He can't reflect attacks he can't perceive by intentionally not reflecting the attack in his back. He tells her no one has ever injured him, and no one will ever injure him. Yuzato keeps running to the front lines, but he's too late. Inumaki falls to her knees, disappointed that she failed Yuzato. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.